Good morning, everyone. If you'll come on in, we're going to get started here. Let's go ahead and, yeah. All right, come on in. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to open up with a prayer. Good morning and welcome to Sunday service. It's December 17th. It's almost Christmas. And it's almost the end of the year. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we, we are just so honored to be able to lift you up and, and fellowship. Uh, God, I pray that the fellowship has already been sweet. Uh, God, we're, able to, we're grateful to lift you up here in prayer. Uh, God, I pray that our prayers, Father, they uh, go up to you. They are a pleasing aroma to you, Father. And we want to lift you up in song as well this morning. I pray that our uh, sort of the, out of the overflow of our hearts of gratitude and joy, uh, just uh, that we sing, God, our, our, may, our, may our eyes connect with one another, Father, may our, may our hearts connect uh, with one another as well as with you, uh, Father, as we sing these songs, and uh, God, we, uh, we come to you, Father, also to take the Lord's Supper together, Father, I pray that that's always a special time to be able to have a, a meal together here as a family, it's a small meal, but we're grateful, God, uh, we're grateful for what... Uh, what it means and uh, what we're able to remember about your body uh, uh, being broken for us and your blood being shed for us. And we're, we're also, God, excited to be able to hear the word preached uh, this morning from Bill and, and God, just to be able to uh, be drawn closer to your word, ultimately closer to you as well. And Father, we're excited that we have a baptism this morning as well. Uh, we're excited for that. Uh, God, we look forward to that celebration. And, and Father, even as uh, the, our, we'll celebrate here today and we'll come back tonight and celebrate it with our children, God, may you uh, really uh, may t this today be a, a real blessing to everyone. Uh, may it edify uh, you, of course, God, but may we edify one another as well. We love you. We lift up this worship service to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remain standing for some singing. Amen, church. It wouldn't be a week before Christmas without starting off with a Christmas song, huh? Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround the earth and have reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around the center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea, chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou art Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other. Lift us to the joy divine. One more, church. Mortals, join the mighty chorus which the morning stars begun. Father, love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music lifts us sunward in the triumph song of life. Amen. Sounds 
sound beautiful. My Jesus. My Jesus, my Savior, oh, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of
strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Oh, the holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come.
Amen. We hearing everything okay? It, got it? Saying yes? You guys are saying no? Everyone's hearing? Okay, awesome. Awesome. Well, welcome, everyone. It's so great to see uh, folks come in that aren't usually with us. Uh, I, I love St. Louis, that it is a place where people come back to. Uh, I'm used to living in cities where everyone's trying to get away from it. Uh, so, so this is a new change. I love it. I love being here. This is awesome. Uh, I've been tasked this morning to try to summarize not only the sermons to the seven churches, but really to summarize all that we've learned this year. And this year has kind of worked out to where our whole goal this year was to present a very scandalous, very real presentation of who Jesus actually is. We started in the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews is this fantastic call to see Jesus as he is, that he is far better than all, that he is greater, he is superior. He is the one that we have to throw our trust into. The challenge at the, uh, for the book of Hebrews was that that was a church that had lost its amen. It lost its sense of this is what we're about. This is who we're about. This is what it's all going to come down to. And of course, uh, then at the end of Hebrews, we immediately jumped over to uh, the, the seven churches of Revelation, which of course worked out conveniently because, uh, you know, the, uh, Vince and I and my wife got a chance to go over there uh, and walk in the ruins of these churches. And we, you've seen great pictures of that. Uh, and uh, boy, what a shocking revelation it is. Because we're introduced to a Jesus that isn't the lamb-carrying shepherd of Sunday school. We we're introduced to one whose eyes were like fire, whose voice and word was like a double-edged sword coming out of its mouth, who stood in the center of the seven golden lampstands, who held the seven stars, which were the seven spirits of God. And he was, it is he who is in control of all reality, not just in control generally but in control of what is really real. And as I see all that's going on, and maybe the revelation of that was he sees the good. I know as good church-going people, usually when someone says, I see you, it's like, uh-oh. <laughs> what exactly did you see? Because I can think of a lot of things I wouldn't want you to see, but Jesus sees all. He sees your faithfulness. He sees what you're about. He sees the times that you hold on. He sees those moments when you decide you're not going to compromise and you, and you keep going. He sees you overcome the fatigue, overcome the agnosium of life that's being thrown at you. He sees you wading through the information, handpicking. That's not true. This is what's right. I'm not going to believe that. This is just a fad. This is just a trend. I'm not going to give my soul to that. He sees all that. And he's not ashamed to lift you up for it. I think for some of us, that was a revelation. I thought Jesus was just out to get me. No. But he does know what's going on. I mean, he's not bashful about going after the stuff that, oh, you saw that part. And we saw him kind of call that out. And then, of course, last week, Vince did a great job of reminding us that he is the amen. You see how nice of a little present that is? Yeah. That we started off studying out a church that had lost its amen. 
And we end up with a direct revelation of what the amen really is. It's Jesus. So be it. You're going to have a lot of choices to make in life. And the choice that Jesus is inviting you to consider is him. If you want to know what's really going to turn the tide of your life, not only this year, but in all years to come, it's going to be him. And in every way, he's trying to capture our creative imagination by giving us these brilliant pictures of what he's all about. Next slide. He's described like this in Revelation 1, verse 12. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. This is John, our tour guide in the fields of Revelation. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet, though dead. And I love that this is the one who at the Last Supper kind of cuddled up to Jesus there. He was the one who laid his head on his breast. Surely not I, Lord. But when he sees Jesus as he actually is, this is the Jesus who summons you to come follow him. This is the Jesus who tells you to deny yourself and take up your cross daily. This is the Jesus who says, uh, uh, just repent and turn from this weaknesses and follow me. This Jesus makes you go, I better take what he has to say seriously. Because John, the beloved disciple, the one who should feel the closest to him, sees him in this state and then just falls apart immediately. That's a, that's a revelation. But this Jesus goes on to address these churches. And in these churches, you know, again, we say this all the time. The Bible wasn't written to us. It was written for us. But when we understand the situations that it was written to, we understand what it's, what's supposed to happen for our understanding. You know, the seven churches have all of these issues. They all get praised for something unless there was nothing to praise, like Laodicea. They all have a criticism because, you know, it's hard to get it all right, except for two churches, and they're, they're just praised because they're hanging on during difficult times of persecution. They're all given instruction. They're told what they need to do, and they're all given a promise. And that's awesome. And I could walk through them all, but you have everything on the internet. You have all the sermons there, and I would encourage you to go back and listen to them. But I do want to highlight the fact that all of the messages end with these amazing promises what's at stake for us when we turn to jesus what is it that he wants to do for us we assume that it's just forgive sin but that is too small of a thing for him he wouldn't die just to make you right he's got something more for you in mind he has a tree of life this eternal life that you don't just wait till the next, you know, the great by and by in the sky, but a life that if you start living now the way that he wants you to, it would be worth living that way for all of eternity. That's eternal life. A life so great that you would have nothing to be ashamed of. Can you imagine living a life so free from worry because you're doing what he wants that even if Google saw everything that you did and listened to every word that you say, you would say, fine. Someone would probably become a Christian if they did that. <laughs> and here he's like, and I'm going to give you something that's going to fuel that forever. He wants to give us a crown of life. The crown of life. The 
I, I'm not too good with crowns. I, I've never been around a crown, but I wouldn't mind having one. I've seen some crowns. I've been to England and seen the king's jewels. Ooh. I've been to Istanbul and walked in and saw the crowns of old from the Ottoman Empire. Wow. I've been to the Vatican and saw more gaudy crowns than I would ever. Oh, my God. I was like, man, if this case were to be sold, we could solve some world hunger. Wow. And Jesus is like, I got something better for you. It's a crown, but it's life giving hidden manna and a, uh, and a stone with a new name, your great do-over, the discovery of who you really are, total fulfillment of all that you were made to be. You know, a, you get to rule over nations. Well, that sounds like something. Receive the morning star. You're faithfully honored and clothed in white. You know, I love weddings because it reminds us of the promise of God. The bride almost always dresses in white. And we know good and well that girl is a dirty, rotten sinner. We do, don't we? We can admit that. Yeah, she's princess for a day. But we all know this girl. She's a dirty, rotten sinner, but not that day, not that moment. She comes down in white because something has made her pure. It's a reflection of the holy. As a father walks his daughter, his creation down to a man to receive her name. It's Eden before the fall. And he goes, oh, it's just a preview, guys. It's just an echo. I got, this is, what it's, this is what you're coming into. This is what I have in mind for you. A place in God's presence, a new name. He's reemphasizing that in the new Jerusalem. And the crazy part, the crazy part, a share of Christ's throne. Wow, right? I'm not sure I want to sit there but I ain't going to tell him no <laughs> if he gives me that invite. And the thing that I stand in awe of is that all of these promises are contingent on a certain phrase he uses over and over again. Next slide. All of these things are going to come to the one who is victorious, to the one who overcomes. Victorious in the NIV, uh, overcomes in, in most modern translations, the ESV and all those, but to the one who overcomes or who is victorious, I'm going to give you all that. But did anyone notice that Christ didn't really tell us how? He tells us to repent. He tells us to, and he gives instruction of, you know, do what you did at first. You know, go back to your first love. You know, get, do all these sort of things. But he never really tells us, so how do we overcome? Do we just hang on? Do we just, when you say repent, is there a certain level of repentance that gives you more of a crown? Or is there, what, what is it? Okay, I know I need to do these things, but what does it mean to overcome? And he doesn't tell us. That should be frustrating. But we know Jesus better than that. He wouldn't just say something and then not, not tell us how to do it. In fact, typical Jesus fashion, he says this with this growing appetite. You've got to imagine you're listening to this letter. You're not just hearing it all broken down week by week, one sermon, one church. You're hearing all the messages to the churches all at the same time, and you're coming to the end, and the question on your mind is probably, so how do we overcome? What does it take? I, I want to be that disciple. I want to be a Nike Christian. I want to win this thing. I want to do this thing. I want some of that problem. I don't understand what it all means, but I want some of that. What does it take? And Jesus is like, I'm glad you asked because what I'm about to do is not tell you what you need to do. I'm going to show you, which is chapters four and five. 
After this, I looked and before me was a door standing open in heaven. And I heard the voice that, first heard, that I first heard speaking to me like a trumpet say, come up here. Okay, so let me just slow down for a moment. Notice the posture of heaven. The door is open. God does not want to close the door on anyone searching for a little hope. If you're breathing, you still got a shot. The door is always open to you. In fact, the vo- in case you missed it, the voice comes in and says, come, which is something you hear a lot in this book. It's mentioned here in chapter four. It's mentioned in chapter one. It's mentioned in chapter 11. And best of all, it's mentioned in chapter 22 at the very end where the spirit and the bride look out after all that's been revealed and say, come. The book of Revelation is an invitation for you to leave the world of your own perception and start to trust the image God has of what reality is. And in this moment, he says, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the thrones, uh, from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder in front of the throne. A throne. Seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. And also in front of the throne was what, what, what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures. They were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had the face of a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings that were covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Sound familiar? Whatever the, whatever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, he who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before who, him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And by, by your will, they were created and have their being. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy? to break the seals and open the scroll. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside of it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. (laughs) 
Did you see it? The God of heaven, in response to all the messages to the church, has this incredible plan for his kingdom. A reign that is supposed to change the world from the inside out. Turn the upside down world to right side up. He's got it written down. He's thought it through. It's sealed with seven seals, meaning that only the perfect one can open it. And here he is, this God, this unapproachable God, this glorious God, who when everyone sees him, all they can do is worship because they cannot measure how great this God is. It would take a team of meteorologists. Did I say it right? Metrologists to measure it and try to come up, and even they could not do it. Because I said weatherman, didn't I? And yeah. Yeah, so, see, she came at me at the last second and says, I have a challenge for you. And I ain't going back down from no challenge. Anyway, his glory is immeasurable. It's immeasurable. And what he has is something for us. Can you imagine, John? Oh, man, I have just taken in these messages which are meant to change the church and everyone in it. It's meant to change the world. If only we could take a look inside. And I noticed that he, can, he said, okay, it's one thing not to open it. Could we at least peek? No. And that must have been a dramatic pause. Who is worthy? And with all the glorious beings that surround the throne, even the ones that already have received crowns. Who's worthy? John can't even describe these living creatures without making up words. Notice they don't have names. They're just living creatures. He's, he's struggling for how great these beings are. Who is worthy? No one. No one can do it. And he weeps. He weeps. And then finally, one of the elders, praise God for elders, right? One of the elders says, don't weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the promised military messiah, the root of David, the one who made David awesome, the one who has always been prophesied about to be the one that could take down any known enemy, anywhere, anytime, that guy has triumphed. That's our word. He is victorious. He has overcome. Hey, don't weep. Someone has done it. And he's like, oh, good. And then he turns to look for a lion. Or at least a sling toting shepherd. He turns to look for some military conqueror. But instead, he sees a lamb. And this is where we go into communion. Because how great is our God? Able to turn things, to speak things, to create things with just his word. Able to take down nations with a word from his mouth. Able to just speak into the very thing that he sees and says, I am going to change you. He is able to do all that you could ask or imagine and even more. But when it comes to winning the world, he could come like a lion and trounce upon these sorry little prey. But instead, he comes like a lamb. To him who overcomes, how are you going to overcome? 
You're not going to overcome by grasping for power as though if I could just get some more money, if I could just get some more influence, if I should just get some more muscle, if I could just get some more stuff, if I could just get some more, more credibility and authority, then I'll be able to change. And, and Jesus is like, I don't know what world you're living in. He who wants to save his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will find it lamb power. Jesus looks into your struggle right now and says, I know you're tempted to try to take control. This is the year where we, this is the time of year where we start to assess how much we've lost. And we start to assess how out of control we are. This is one of the toughest seasons for most people. Oh, we put on a good face. But boy, if it wasn't for those kids dressing up in cuteness level 11 tonight, we could easily walk through this time super depressed. Because we look back all we set out to do, we know we all failed. How are you going to get it back? Well, I'm going to get into a gym. I'm going to, I'm going to do this, that, and the other. I'm going to get me some more education. I'm going to get me some more power. I'm going to get me some more influence. I'm going to vote a certain way. I'm going to do this a certain way. I'm going to put this on Instagram in a certain way. And Jesus is like going, that's so cute. <laughs> you are adorable. But you're never going to change your sorry life until you do it my way lamb power you could be a lion some of you are lying like already but you have to choose to be a lamb this is where the tree of life becomes available and your eternal life starts now this is where the crown of life becomes available because you cast your crown down just like the elders. And he starts to give you one that you couldn't earn on your own. This is the life that eternity is meant to make of, may be made of. A life free from guilt and shame because it's been atoned for and now you can live free. And it's pictured in an act that's lamb-like. It's baptism. Next slide. Baptism is when you join in the lamb. Because it makes it possible for you to choose to give up yourself. You go into the water dead to self. You're buried because that's what you do with dead things. And then you're brought out to life. But along the way, life gets sucked away when we, get, when we don't get it on straight. And so we come back to the questions that we started the year with. Is the sun better than everything else? He was when you made him Lord. Is the son leading you to a life, uh, to live the life God has called you to embrace? That's what we did when we promised. Is the son causing me to change the things that in my life that don't please God? You know, when you went into the water, you weren't sin free. You were just told all your sins were forgiven. But because of the water, you came out and said, man, whatever I got to do. Whatever I got to be, I, I just don't want to be living that way anymore. It wasn't something you were trying to earn. It was, a, it was a reality you were trying to live. Lamb power. Is the son making me available to be God's spokesperson? I don't want to just share my faith. I want to show my faith. And when it's seen, they see someone that could be a lion but chooses to be a lamb. Self-sacrificing love. That's what communion is all about. It's the reminder that something was broken down for us. The glory of God in Revelation 1 decided you were worth leaving all that glory behind 
so that he can come down, walk in your place, die for your sins, and then overcome by the power of the Lamb. When you take the, when you take the communion today, take a moment and really break it. Break it, because that's his body broken for you. And before you just put down that swig of juice, think about it. His blood covers you. It's lamb power. And let's drink of that today. Amen. Here we go. Here we go. Got that one? Yes. Hey, let's all stand and let's each section go kind of lock arm in arm. Can we do that before, as we pray this, uh, this morning? Thank you, Bill. Let's pull together. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we can do it, too. <laughs> it's okay to talk a little bit. Yeah. We love each other here. Good deal. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. You gave us the ultimate gift. And right now as we remember what Jesus has done for us, we ask that we can be humble and broken before you. Mm. And Father, we thank you so much for the Holy Spirit you gave us at baptism. And Father, we thank you so much for the generations that were before us that fought the good fight, that led us to this direction. We pray and, and thank you so much for our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, whoever it was that was praying for us, that, that they were praying for us that we would walk in the light. And, Father, we pray for the generations to come, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, that they all walk the narrow path and go through the gate and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We praise and thank you for the opportunity just to live a life worthy of the Lamb. We give you the glory and the honor. Jesus, we love you. Dear God, help us to obey your instruction, to meditate on you, on your goodness. Thank you for the book of Revelation. God, help us to meditate on your correction as you corrected the churches there and your discipline to each of us, God. And you do so because you love each and every one of us so much. You are our sacrificial lamb. And Father, help us to imitate you and to also be sacrificial. Father, during this holiday season, help us to love our friends and to love our neighbors. The way you call us to do, God. The way you, Jesus did it. And also, Father, uh, we just ask that... Uh, we can love our families during this time as well. As much as we want to spend time together, God, there are times that, you know, maybe we're not the sacrificial lamb like we should be throughout that holiday time. So help us, God. Help us be the initiators. Help us be uh, the ones who lead by example. God, help us love our grandparents, to love our parents, to love our siblings, to love our in-laws. Yes, to love our children. And probably the easiest of all, to love our grandchildren. But God, you love us more than we could ever love uh, you or anyone. And God, we just take this time to just thank you for Jesus. What a perfect example in every way. Mm -hmm. And we just love you, and we want to give you all the honor and all the glory. And we're so grateful for this congregation, God, that you've given us. Mm -hmm. And we pray all of this through Jesus our Lord. And everyone did say, Amen. Amen.
Good morning, church. Happy holidays. Uh, my name is Edwin Baldelamar. Uh, you may know me better because I'm the husband of my beautiful Rachel Baldelamar. <laughs> Um, I have the honor to share with you, uh, God's children, the bride of Christ, just my reflections on contribution or the offering, and a journey God has been taking me on. Um, when I was asked to speak today, I knew it was going. I knew it was going to be coming because God has given my wife and I a story to glorify His name, a story I get to share with you today about His faithfulness. So most of you probably recall this past summer, my wife ruptured her Achilles tendon. You may have seen her in a boot. Um, you know, she had surgery to repair it, and a lot of things changed for us. Our routines changed, our dynamics changed, and our finances changed. My wife was out of work for almost five months, and I knew we'd be getting her hospital bill in the near future. I knew we wouldn't be getting her added income. Anxiety, worry, and fear were all knocking at the doorsteps of our emotions and faith. And I didn't realize until then that God had been preparing my wife and I for this time. We rewind about nine months before this, and God had put on my heart just to seek after wisdom about materialism, just about in our culture, and to deepen my understanding of what really contentment as God desires for my wife and I, what, what that means and what that looks like for us. We found some really great scriptures, some devotionals, and other material, material on the topic. And, you know, we would talk about it at length, meditate it on our own times, and allow God to stir in our hearts about it. And, he used this time to make us aware of really two key things. And one, the type of desires within us that aligned with our needs and the desires that were in excess to it. And how and two, how God really provides all we need and more to us. You know, I could go on about what we learned, but the relevant point here is that God was also preparing our hearts for a time of refining so we can put into practice the things that we had learned. Modern teaching theory asserts that in order for a person to really comprehend something, a very effective way is the combination of didactic and experiential instruction. <laughs> uh, you know, putting into the mind and then being able to practice it. And there's no better teacher than our God. And throughout this time, God had used... A, a particular scripture, really a whole chapter that kept showing up in various ways and just various times for our didactic training. And I'm going to read out of Matthew 6. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So why do you worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. God kept putting onto my mind, what does seek his kingdom first look like? Not just in one part of my life, but in all parts of my life. And it's something I'm still working through, you know, growing and learning. But fast forward back to this summer when this time came. Anxiety, worry, and fear were all knocking at the doorsteps of our emotions and faith. And we had moments that did push us to the edge. But it was amazing. Nothing less than divine intervention, but the amount of peace and hope that we had. Deep within me, I knew things were going to be all right. I didn't know how, but the Holy Spirit helped me to remain calm and lead my family in calmness. When we got our hospital bill, we thought we'd be shocked by the amount of zeros in it. We were shocked but by how few zeros were in it. We thought our finances and savings were going to take a major hit, but when the short-term injury assistance that kicked in for my wife's job, we were speechless. You know, after a few months, a question did arise if we should change our tithing amount, since our total income had changed. And you know, I can remember this specific moment so vividly because of the emotions and spirit it had stirred up within me. God had long been preparing my heart for this time and for this moment for quite some time. And I c recall from within me, there was no hesitation to say, no, God has, 
God had been faithful to us, so we're going to remain faithful to him in this. And of course, you know, it could have been right to change, you know, if it was done in faith and pursuit of his will, but this is what I felt he was calling us. You know, he is faithful to us even when we are faithless. And I don't mean to boast for myself. You know, I still had some worry, but glory to God because he knows us better than I know myself. And I'm a testament that he leads us to green pastures when we listen to our good shepherd. You know, in the following months, eventually that short-term resistance stopped. And, you know, again, anxiety, worry, and fear were all knocking at our doorsteps of emotions and faith. But again, God had given me a peace and faith that I can't explain. And I'll say at this point, I truly didn't know what to expect, and I knew whatever happened, God's will would be done. I just waited and see, and each month, God continued to show us that he and he alone is Jireh and our provider. So I conclude that my giving is not just a contribution to support the missions of God's body, though it is. It's an act of worship that I get to partake in, and it's also a regular practice for my heart to continually increase the trust and faith I have in God and the continual reminder that Lord will be the master that I serve. All glory to God. There's a black box if you have a contribution to give here. You can give online. Uh, thank you, and I'll pray for our contribution today. Uh, Father God, we thank you for just being, for, for having all the different types of you know, names that you have, God. It's just provider uh, among the many, God, Lord. We trust in you. We put our hope in you, God, Lord. We pray for just the offering and that you just multiply it, God, Lord, because you can do anything just with two pennies or with w with whatever amount we give, God, Lord. We pray that we give faithfully, that you help us search our hearts, God, Lord, and just understand where it is that you want us to be giving, God, Lord. We thank you just for the many blessings that you do give us, for the jobs that we have, to not just be a light in, but also contribute, to earn something, God, Lord, and just be able to give to your people and to those around us, to our neighbors, God, Lord. We pray you continue to just to lead us, God, Lord, continue to convict us in air the areas we can give, such as our time and just in uh, other, other things, other talents that you've given us, God, Lord. Pray for all these things in Jesus' name, amen. That was awesome. Wow. Thanks, Edwin. Thanks for your great story and example. Uh, we're landing the plane. We're getting ready to end service with a bang, okay? I got a few announcements. Happy holidays to everyone. Uh, super excited about this time of the year. But we got a few more things going on to close out 2023. First of all, we have uh, Women's Midweek this Wednesday. And ladies, we're going to keep it short and awesome. So come at 7. We're going to praise our great and awesome God. I'm grateful for Shanna Kahayev. She is going to lead us in an amazing time of worship. We're going to have a, a short lesson. And we're going to encourage each other with some good news on Wednesday night. So please come if you can. Also, um, Mr. Ed Carr, one of our own, will be here for Christmas Eve. We are having a Christmas Eve service, okay? So we're going to have donuts at 9 o'clock, and then at 10 o'clock, we're going to have a great service. Ed Carr is going to be preaching the word, and we're, we're just going to have a great time together um, on the 24th. I'm really excited about this announcement, okay? Our kids have been working so hard on Straight Out of Bethlehem, and the day has come for them to perform. I'm really excited. We do have a, a oh, hold on. We got some shepherds. Hey, shepherds. Who are you looking for? Are you looking for Jesus? Who are you? Are you looking for the Savior? No, that's not the baby you're looking for. You know, uh, oh, yes, baby Jesus is going to be here tonight, and I'm super excited about it. But okay, this is what you need to do go that way and come back. No, this way and come back here tonight at 7 o'clock, and you will see the baby Jesus. Right on. Right on. Right on. <laughs> All right. So we are so excited about our play. 
A few things before I get into details, a little few details about tonight is, we are having cookies tonight to start off our time. And um, if you would like to bring cookies so that we have enough for everyone, I would greatly appreciate that. We will have cookies at six before the show starts and after um, the play tonight. The other thing is we need a photographer. So if you love taking pictures, please see myself or uh, Stacy Mayfield and let us know if you can take pictures tonight. And then one more thing that would make tonight awesome, we want to get this on video so that we can see it. So if you have a tripod with that holds a, a cell phone, please see myself or Stacy Mayfield. Stacy, stand up. This is Stacy Mayfield. She's awesome. And let us know if we could use your tripod and your cell phone tonight. So just a few details. I'm going to go over a few details. Like I said, we're going to start at 6 o'clock. And doors will open at 6.15. We are having uh, different seating. So the families of the people in the cast have VIP sit seating. So this it's going to be marked off. Um, if you got a ticket to come to tonight, we are sold out. Like, we gave out all of our tickets. So if you have a ticket, uh, we have general seating, and you will be seated. We are asking that there are no spaces between the seats because we have a full house. So we got to get, like, really cozy tonight, okay? So don't save any seats, and don't leave any spaces between the seats. Um, and then if you don't have a ticket... You can come, but you will be in the overflow section. And it's, it's a little more challenging to see, but we will have our screens that you can watch the play on, okay? So we really do want everyone to come tonight. The cast has worked so hard to put this together, and they are ready to, um, to present to you straight out of Bethlehem, okay? <laughs> we'll have one ticket. So if you don't have a ticket and you want a ticket, please see Stacy Mayfield, okay? So last but not least, Bill did an amazing job preaching the word. Oh, she has three, okay? <laughs> he did an amazing job preaching the uh, word today. Bill, thank you so much for summing up just how great Jesus is and how we need to follow him and his plan for our lives. And I want to direct your attention over to the baptism because we have a sister who wants to make Jesus Lord of her life, and I'm going to hand it over to Miss Kristen Molden. Awesome, guys. Can you hear me? Okay, we got it on now. We got our box. Yeah, this is, I don't think I really need to say anything because this sermon just kind of sums up Cece. This is Cece Garcia, everybody. She's amazing. You know, this whole sermon kind of sums up your journey, and I just want to say what a privilege it was to, for all of us, including Gwen, and um, to study the Bible with you. You, you just, you are just a light, and you took hold of the scriptures, and you're like, no, this is this is what I want, and I'm so thankful for Nate introducing you to the church. Because you had asked, like, I really want to get to know God. And Nate said, there's only one place that I know. And so, you know, thank you, Nate, <laughs> for giving us just a best friend. And um, my daughter loves you as well so much. And I just want to remind you before you're baptized, you know, Jesus is the only one that saves. And we can look for a lot of other things, but there's nowhere to go but to our Savior. And so thank you for making this commitment. We commit to you that we will help you to grow and teach you more. Thank you for just being a delight to our whole group in St. Charles. Um, they're, her and Nate are like all in, all in for, you know, holidays. And uh, we just love the joy that you bring to all of us. So the girls wanted to share a little bit. Um, Cece, it's just been such, like Kristen said, it's been such a privilege and honor to study with you. Um, I know it's been inspiring to me, and um, it's just been so cool to see how God has been growing you. Um, you, like she said, when you want something, you go after it. 
I love your determination and um, you've just gone after your relationship with God and you've been talking about how you want to get baptized now for at least a few weeks and it's cool to see your excitement and just to see your transformation and um, it's just an honor and very grateful to God to be in your studies. Yeah, I feel like there's a pattern of just your character and uh, how fun it's been to, to study with you and see your character come out. I think that was like one of the first things she said to us is like, I'm determined. I love growth. I want to learn. And so we're like, this is going to be easy. <laughs> and she made it easy. Her love for God is so clear. Um, so I just have a script that I want to share. It's First Chronicles 16, verse 11. It says, look to the Lord and his strength, see his face always. And just playing off of Kristen, it's so easy to, to get distracted by the world, to feed into the lies of it. But if you look to the Lord's strength and seek his face, you're going to do great. And you have all of us, all these people here yeah. to support you and love you. So we're so proud and grateful for you. We love you. Cece's a little shy, so she's not going to share. <laughs> well, come on over here, girl. <laughs> So we're going to ask you a few questions before you're baptized. And um, are you sure you don't want to share? Okay. <laughs> um, she just has such a great heart. But um, do you believe that Jesus is from heaven? He came down for our sins? Yes. Amen. What is your good confession? Jesus is Lord. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So because of that confession, Cece, we can now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You'll be given the gift of the Holy Spirit and all your sins will be forgiven and you'll be added to God's glorious kingdom and become a precious daughter of God. So we love you. You ready to get in? I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Filled with the Holy Ghost, I am. And all my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. Oh, yeah. Well, that's not all. There's more beside. Well, that's not all. There's more beside. Well, that's not all this boy beside. I've been to the river and I've been baptized. And all my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. Oh, yeah. Let's pray. As we close out, Father, we are just, uh, what a great time of worship today. And thank you, God, for answering our prayers. And thank you, God, for being here with us. Thank you for moving our hearts today, for uh, comforting those that needed comforting, God, and making us uh, those of us that needed to be made a little uncomfortable, doing that for us as well. You always meet us where we are, yet, God, you always, as Bill shared, your eyes on us. You see us. And um, while that could be a little intimidating, God, it also is very comforting. Thank you for watching over us, for protecting us, for loving us, for challenging us, for inspiring us. And thank you for allowing us to experience this miracle today of watching um, our new sister uh, become part of your family. Thank you for the miracle of life. Thank you for the miracle of rebirth. And thank you for today. We pray for a great rest of the, the day. I pray that the worship will continue, that uh, we'll be able to take this with us, God, as we leave here and bring it back tonight and bring it with us to work and throughout the week and, uh, and everything else. We love you so much. We need you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Make sure you welcome your sister, CC. You are dismissed.